top-down mixing or master track processing as I prefer to call it is a great way to jumpstart your mix so that it's closer to the final version of the mix before you start doing anything on individual channels and to kind of glue it together so it feels like one cohesive mix that's breathing together as opposed to just a bunch of tracks. This is a very simple step in the mixing process that you do not want to skip and you want to do it at the beginning of the mixing process and mix through it. So we're going to get into it in just one second but before we do if you don't know already this is the second video in my mix like a pro series where we're just going through the six steps that all professional mixes have and how to do them specifically inside Logic. If you don't already have it, be sure to grab my six step checklist to a pro mix. It's just a simple guide that goes through these same six steps so you can easily and quickly reference back to it anytime you're mixing. And if you're following this in real time, it gives you all six steps right now, but it allows you to quickly reference it so you don't have to keep coming back to these videos every time you're mixing. It's free from the link in the description below, so be sure to pick it up. Let's go and jump into Logic and start doing some master track processing. So here's our session. If you've been following along, you know all we've done so far is the static mix, so we don't really have any processing on individual channels yet, but we've set all of our individual channel levels and our pan positions and all that stuff so that we have a good mix, relative balance across all the tracks and enough headroom at the top. So it's really important to do this before doing any sort of master track processing. Okay, now a quick thing that I highly recommend you do before you jump into master track processing is actually export your song out, bounce it out. Now I'm gonna set my cycle region here to just be the whole duration of the song from the very, very beginning. So I can drop it right at the beginning of the session and then it's okay as long as it ends after the song ends. It's, you don't have to be too technical with this. And then we're just gonna hit bounce down here and you wanna make sure you have PCM selected, file format wave. And then I just like to make sure that dithering is set to none. And then we'll hit okay. Pay attention to where you're bouncing this. We're just gonna call this the static mix and it will take a second to bounce out. We're gonna re-import that into our session. And what this gives us is a really quick way to easily reference back to our static mix without any of the processing as we're getting further along into the mixing process so that we know we're moving the mix into the right direction. This gives us very important perspective so that we know we're moving in the right direction and there's not something from the raw tracks that maybe actually sounded better before we started doing processing. And if we have this as something we can easily and quickly reference back to any time, then it's just gonna help us continue to make sure that our mix is getting better and better and never actually moving backwards. Okay, so now that it's exported out, we're just gonna go down to the bottom of our session here. We're gonna find that file in the finder, so be sure to pay attention to where it is you're saving it. And we're just gonna drag it in to the very beginning of our session. And it'll take a second to import. We'll go ahead and hit mute. And now what I can do is I can easily switch back and forth between the static mix and our full mix. And again, as we continue to move through the mixing process, this will give me an easy way to reference that. So if I solo it, we're listening to the static mix here that we can export it out. If I unsolo it, we're gonna hear what's actually going on in our session. Okay, and then one more thing before we get into it, we're also gonna save a project alternative. So we're gonna go up here to file, project alternatives, and we're just gonna hit new alternative, and we will call this one master track processing or top down mixing, whatever you wanna call it. Okay, so now it's finally time to actually do some master track processing. So your master track, we're gonna find in your mix view here, and it's gonna be the next to last track in your session. So your last track here is your master, your master track or your stereo output or your two bus, whatever you wanna call it. If you bring it over from GarageBand, it will default to being called your master track. If you're coming in from Logic, it will likely just be called your stereo output. No matter what, it's gonna be this track here. And this is the track that your entire song runs through. If you're not positive you're on that track, a quick way to check it is we can listen to your song and we can mute it. And if it mutes everything, then it's probably your master track. Now, when it comes to master track processing, there's two things that every professional mix or nearly every professional mix has on their master track. And kind of a third bonus thing that's really, really easy to kind of just integrate into the process that we'll look at at the end. The first is EQ. EQ is how we shape the tone of our mix. And we don't want to be doing a lot here with EQ. So first thing we're going to do is just open up our EQ. Now with this, I encourage you to think of your EQ largely in three broad areas. You have your bass, you have your mids, and then you have your treble, kind of like a car stereo. So our bass is over here on the left, we have our mids in the middle, and then we have our treble on the far end. With your master track, you don't really want to be getting into the weeds and doing anything surgical. You want to just be doing a gentle lift in the areas that need it. Now, this is going to depend on your song, but for a lot of songs, modern mixes, this is going to mean a little bit more low end and a little bit more high end. Again, if you end up having way more low end in your song or you want less low end in your song, you might not end up wanting to do that move. But those are the two areas that I encourage you to look at. This is sometimes called the smiley face curve EQ. So the main area that we're going to look at is kind of 100 and below. And we're going to do that on a shelf, which lifts everything from here and below. So what I like to do is just find 
where it's giving me the right kind of feeling in the low end and just do a gentle bump. So I might exaggerate it to hear it and then scale it back to be a little bit more reasonable. So in a lot of cases with our master track, we don't want to be doing moves over maybe three decibels. And sometimes you might be doing a one decibel bump, just a very, very subtle bump. But these moves across your entire mix add up to being a nice, uh, gentle uh, push in the right direction. This is like jumpstarting a mix. And what this allows us to do is do less of these low end and high end bumps on individual tracks and get a lot of that work done here in one place on the master track. So let's find this point here. So somewhere right around 90 hertz is working for me on this song and a, a bump of about two decibels is enough that I'm feeling the benefit, but it's not overwhelming the low end. So as little as you can, but as much as you need, but on the master track, you wanna keep that nice and subtle. Okay, the next area is gonna be up in this high end area. And typically there's some mixes that I might be doing just a little lift way up high here. In other mixes like this, I might bring it down into the more two, three K range, but you just wanna play around with it exaggerated, find where it feels good or starts to feel harsh and maybe back it away away from that area. And if it's feeling really good, then that's probably the right area to be in. So we're gonna start up high and bring it down until I start to notice it, maybe adding stuff I don't want it to add and I'll scale it back and then scale back the amount. So notice right here, it starts to feel maybe slightly harsh. But if I come up here, it stops feeling harsh. So that's a good indicator. I don't want to get into that area. I probably want to tailor that area a little more specifically on individual tracks. I'm just going to do a little bit of a lift right here. Okay, and the last thing we're going to do is just balance the output volume. So I'm going to turn it down so it's the same volume off and on. Check it out. Let's go back to earlier in the song here. Okay, so all I did was turn it down just a little bit, about a decibel, and now it's the same volume, or roughly the same volume off and on. We don't want to just do boosts that then trick our ears to thinking it sounds better just because it's actually making it a little bit louder. So now I can honestly and accurately assess, do I like the sound of what this EQ is adding to this? So check that out. This is off. This is on. As soon as you click it on, it just feels a little bit cleaner, a little bit fuller, a little higher fidelity, almost like you took a little bit of a blanket off the sheets, right? It gives you a little bit of that effect. So that's EQ, very, very simple, very small moves here. And you're focusing broadly, generally in most mixes around the low end and the high end. Okay, let's talk about the second element, which is gluing our mix together with a little bit of compression. Now for this, you wanna make sure that you're centered around a louder section in the song. So I'm gonna just go up here and bring this back to just be, this area. Otherwise, if you set this in a quieter section of the song, you might end up setting your compressor to work in a quieter section, but then when it gets to the louder section, it's pushing it way too hard. So set it in a louder section and then check it in other areas of your song. So we're gonna go here and just pull up the default under dynamics compressor here, and we'll do it in stereo. And my preference, my favorite is the vintage VCA. This is kind of like an SSL model, I'm pretty sure. First thing you wanna do is turn auto gain off. Then you wanna set your threshold all the way up so that it's not compressing initially and we'll dial it back. I like to set my attack time to about 30 milliseconds. This is important because what you're doing here is you're allowing that initial hit through. You're not clamping down on all those initial hits. And that allows them to still kind of pump and have a little bit of motion. But as soon as it passes that threshold, let it through and then bring it back down just a little bit. So it kind of breathes with them in a way that's nice without kind of cutting off the hits. The next area, sometimes I will leave this on auto. In this case, I'm gonna turn it off and I'm gonna set it around 100 millisecond release, which is fairly fast for a master bus compressor, but I find that it's slow enough that it's not pumping. So if you have it too fast, it's gonna be like turning down really quickly and you're gonna feel it coming back up where it shouldn't. So around 100 milliseconds tends to be kind of a sweet spot. It's based on the SSL uh, G bus compressor. 
And then anywhere two to one up to about four to one on most mixes work. And I typically, as a starting point, set this based on genre and kind of style of the mix. So with a light, super light acoustic-y mix, I might be going two to one, maybe even 1.8 to one, really light down on that side. So down over here. And then as I get more rock, I will move it up and up. This song is, a, you know, kind of like a pop rock song. So three to one or four to one, I think is gonna be the sweet spot. We'll go ahead and leave it about four to one here. And then we're just gonna set our threshold and our makeup gain, uh, and that's gonna allow us to kind of dial in the amount that we want on our meter here. So with this in the loudest section of your song, you probably only wanna be getting two to three decibels of gain reduction on this meter. So as this is playing here, I just wanna be getting, as I bring my threshold down, Somewhere around here. We can maybe get a little bit more on some of the louder hits. And then we're just gonna dial in just a little bit of makeup gain so that it's the same volume off and on. And you can kind of get an initial idea based on the input versus output. So we can look at that here. Input is around negative 3.6, over here it's about negative four. So we can maybe do one and a half. So use that as your initial uh, indicator and then also check with your ears. So now if I turn this off, Back on. Um, back on. It doesn't sound louder, but it does sound a little bit fuller, a little bit more upfront, a little bit more present, right? That's the whole idea here. And just these two moves, so just our EQ and our compression, if I turn this off, listen to how much it impacts the mix. So I'll have it off and then I'll engage it. And notice when it comes on, you're gonna get a little bit of movement and it's gonna kind of glue together and it's gonna feel a little bit higher fidelity from the EQ moves. Check that out. Off, kind of muffled. Feel the kick drum kick through a little bit more. Back off. Back on. So it definitely adds to the mix already. We've moved our mix in the right direction. The kick drum's kicking through a little bit. The tone shaping moves us to a more final sound, not totally polished yet, but more polished sounding than before. And all we did was two very simple things, EQ and compression. Now, I mentioned there's a third thing that's kind of like a bonus thing, and that's saturation. This is something you can dial in and of itself, but what's really cool about this built-in stock compressor in Logic is it has these vintage emulations, and this distortion over here, what it really is is saturation, as long as you don't push it too hard and so if we switch this over to soft we're going to add a little bit of volume but we're going to get a little bit of that analog saturation as if we were running through a, an analog piece of gear in the real world and so what i like to do is set it to soft and then just dial my output gain i found it's about two decibels seems to be offsetting the volume that this extra saturation adds and that's just going to give us a little bit more presence uh, and a little bit more warmth to the mix as if we'd recorded through some amount of analog gear Okay, so let's check this out again now off and on with that saturation dial. This is off. Back on. Off. Back on. Pretty cool, right? Two little moves and a little bit of saturation and we're getting way more clarity, fullness, and punch in our mix already before we even start doing anything on individual channels. Okay, so before you go, be sure to grab the six step checklist to a pro mix from the link in the description below. It's really gonna help you out. You can just quickly reference it anytime you're mixing. And I'd love to hear from you. Is this something you've been doing in your mixes? Let me know in the comments below. Is there anything new that you picked up from this video? Let me know, I'd love to hear from you. If this video was helpful, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll be back next week with the third step in the mixing process. One thing